to a new video from Jörg Joggler 66 Hour of the Truth in collaboration once again with our wonderful brother in Christ Tom Fress from the United States of America who is joining me via Skype so we are quote unquote connected um, via the internet so that we can have a conversation a reading together in which we will tell you that there are many many verses in the New Testament that prove that Daniel 70 is weak that means the prophecy that was by the angel Gabriel, angel Gabriel foretold to the prophet Daniel in Babylonian captivity of the first coming of Jesus Christ is completely and utterly fulfilled in the New Testament. Actually, the New Testament is not only the witness, the New Testament is the fulfilling of the 70th week. This is what we are going to prove to you scripturally, not with our words, but with the words of the Bible. And now, of course, it's time to welcome Brother Tom Fress from the United States. Hello, Brother. Hello, Yerk. Nice to be here and uh, nice to be back with the listeners again. Let's go right down to business. Huh? Yeah. Uh, I have the text here. Last time we finished on this page two of uh, seven pages, but I will do for continuity sakes, repeat uh, this part of Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 to make an end of sins and read to you the verses in the New Testament that confirm that Jesus Christ was and by the way still is because he is a living God. He is still there um, where he belongs to in the throne or on the throne on heaven next to the Father that he is the fulfillment of the 70 years week and that he was and is the one that made and makes an end of sins. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, we read, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. The Scriptures, of course, here is, for the most part, Daniel chapter 9. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, it reads, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And Hebrews chapter 9, verses 26 through 28 reads, quote, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin 
by the sacrifice of himself. You cannot get any clearer than this, right? And as it is, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And I also found another verse that reads in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, quote, And he shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Yeah? Save the people from their sins means, means to bring an end to sin, and shall save his people. Well, that is referring to another part, that is in verse 27. He will make a covenant with many, right? But that's something we go to a little bit later in. Now, the next and the verse that we are dealing with for the moment, or the part of the verse 24 we are dealing with now, today in the second broadcast of the series, is to make reconciliation for iniquity. In Romans chapter 5, verse 10, we read, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. This is the first confirmation of that Jesus Christ made reconciliation for iniquity with coming in this earth and being here in the flesh, fulfilling the first three and a half years of the last week of the 70-week prophecy in the flesh to bring reconciliation or to make reconciliation for iniquity. Romans 5.10. Tom, you have a comment on that, what I read so far? Well, yes, I would like to ask the listeners a a specific question that demands an answer. We've already seen in the brief time that we've been involved in this study that the New Testament literally count by count uh, uh, accounts for every tenet of Daniel's prophecy, Daniel's 70-week prophecy. It it's it's it at this point it becomes virtually amazing to me how anyone who is familiar with Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9 particularly verses 24 through 27 that which is called the 70 weeks of Daniel those who are familiar with that prophecy and and most of them are because their belief system is all attached about a attached to a seven year period of time called the seventy weeks of Daniel, where the so called Antichrist makes a covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease. The the Antichrist is supposedly going to make a covenant with uh, the Jews or somebody, and. Uh, and then by that, by that covenant or breaking that covenant which he makes, cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And in that very same prophecy, it talks about bringing in everlasting righteousness. Is that what the Antichrist is going to do? That defies common sense, let alone biblical sense. Is he going to make reconciliation for iniquity? The Antichrist going to make reconciliation for iniquity? I mean, what we're taught in the churches is, is, is uh, well, it, it is so contradictory. Foolishness, what Tom. The, That's the well, word you're absolutely. looking for. A foolishness is, is hardly a word to describe it. And uh, certainly the, my great hope is that through the study of this word, that is the New Testament, we're showing the very verses in the Bible that confirm to us that it was Jesus who did all these things, that it was Jesus who made a covenant with many for one week, that it was Jesus that in the midst of that 70th and final week caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease because he himself became the sacrifice a one-time, all-sufficient sacrifice for sin, thereby making an end of sin, thereby making an end of sacrifices and oblations, 
thereby reconciling us to God, thereby opening the kingdom of heaven, thereby completely fulfilling every tenet of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. Listen, this may be, for most people that are listening, the most important and life-changing Bible study that they will ever participate in. Because it renders laughable any discussion of a future 70th week of Daniel, where any, not the least all, of this prophecy is supposed to be fulfilled. It should make any pastor behind any pulpit in any church in this world embarrassed to tears to continue to preach a future seven week a uh, seven week a uh, seven year period of time called the 70th week of Daniel and that the antichrist will 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 uh, offer or confirm a covenant that he will break after three and a half years it's absolutely ludicrous it defies the very written text in the new testament it defies common sense and it is so is such a laughable teaching that we ought to laugh it to scorn and then we have to deal with the reality that generally speaking everyone who professes himself to be a christian in this day and age has believed has believed the lie okay i'm not looking down my long nose in in criticism of 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 christians because i am one and for 50 long years of my life i believed in that futurist nonsense so when I speak in derision of those who continue to preach and to continue to believe in a 70th week of Daniel in the future, I count myself. I'm not exempt from any of the criticism. I am one of the deceived or was one of the deceived. And it just it staggers my mind that I could have been so easily deceived over something that is so easily proven in the scriptures to be an outright lie, an in-your-face lie, one that even a babe in the scriptures would not believe. And uh, that poses another question. How much should we really depend on these pastors behind the pulpits of our churches to teach us what the scriptures say and what they mean? How much reliance should we continue to place on big hair and three-piece suits and diamond rings and beautiful voices and shiny white teeth and fancy cars and fancy houses who make a living preaching these lies? You know what the Bible calls him? What the Bible calls him? A hireling. He's a hireling. He gets paid to preach his BS. He gets paid handsomely. I think it's time to cut him off. You know, we hear uh, the expression nowadays that's become popular, defund them. I think that's what we ought to do. Defund every Protestant and evangelical liar and preach the biblical, historical, and prophetic truth as revealed to us by the infallible written word of Almighty God, the authorized 1611 King James Bible, and send all the liars packing to a soup line somewhere. That's what needs to happen. And if you hear a little anger in my voice, just remember that for 50 years of my life, the lion's share of my life, the best years of my life, I was deceived by these fancy-suited deceivers. And now I know better. 
I'm more well-read in the scriptures. I'm not so easy to deceive anymore. And I've got a bit of a dis... I've got a bit of a problem with those who have made fancy livings off of my tithe money while at the same time offering me ludicrous nonsense in their eschatology. Back to you, Yerk. I think, Tom, it is even more than understandable that when you realize after 50 years of your lives that you have been taught to live a lie. Even though That's that right. you are someone who appreciates the truth. I mean, when we are born and when we, raise, when, we, when we are being raised up, everybody tells us how important it is to speak the truth. But when you do, they look at you as if you have two heads. They don't want to hear the truth. We are raised in a world that lives off a lie. And I think personally, Tom, if I was in your shoes, being raised more or less Christiany, because your parents attended church, your whole family attended church, you have always been a quote-unquote Christian, just to use that name for um, understandable sake for anyone who listens here, and then you come after all these years to the conclusion that you have been told a lie when they preach from the book of truth, from the Bible, I think I would be even more outrageous than you. I can understand that anger, because you threw away so many years of your life that you could have spent with a more honest and more to the real truth leading study than what you have done. You see how you wasted a big part of your life. And not only you, but everybody who now watches these videos and is also waking up. You know, the reason why I put this picture in here of this quote-unquote devil having the ASV Bible version in his hand is because in the Bible it says that Satan is transformed into an angel of light. And therefore, it is no wonder that his, uh, that his uh, servants are uh, changed into ministers of righteousness. No, the, word, the word is ministers. Ministers it's of righteousness. Ministers yeah, ministers of righteousness. Are transformed into ministers of righteousness. Yeah. That's, that's, that, that's as clear a description, an infallible, biblical description of those who occupy the space behind the pulpits of our churches. Uh, the point is... Again, again the scripture says... Satan is transformed or changed into an angel of light. Therefore, therefore, his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. So whose minister are they who preach righteousness but who deceive the people? It's the great deceiver. They're ministers of Satan, not ministers of light. And I, I, that's the, that is the clearest biblical scriptural description of where Satan truly dis resides in the Christian world. It's right behind the pulpits of the churches. I've asked this question many times to listeners. If Satan... Now, we already know Satan already, you know, he already owns the wickedness of this world. That's not the challenge for him. The challenge for Satan is to destroy God's people. So if he wished to destroy God's people, and he does wish to destroy God's people, that's his full-time preoccupation, destroying God's people any way he can. If it's Satan's goal to destroy God's people, where would you expect to find him? And most people can't answer the question, but the, ob the answer is obvious. If Satan wishes to deceive God's people, they, that Satan would be most productive in the churches. And that's, you know, that just seems too unlikely for people. They just walk away from that concept. But the truth of the matter is, Satan achieved the best place to deceive and to devour God's people, 
and that's right behind the pulpits of the churches, and you have confirmation directly from the Scripture that that is going to be his position. Right behind the pulpit of your churches, when the Bible told us plainly that Satan is transformed into an angel of light, and therefore his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. Okay? They look, sound, act, talk, walk, and sleep like ain't mi like ministers of righteousness, but they serve Satan. And what is Satan teaching them to teach us? That Jesus was not the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Okay? Which means, literally, Messiah has not come in the flesh because Daniel's 70th week is the seven-year period of time in history that proves that Jesus was the Messiah, that proves that he made a covenant with us for, a, for, for seven years of a period of time, and that after three and a half years he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease when he confirmed the covenant in his blood. Three and a half years later, I'll tell you, it is so outrageous. It is so angering as to be the hottest topic to be discussed in the Christian world right now. How could we have been so easily deceived by such an unbelievable lie? And again, I'm not looking down my nose at anyone. I believed this nonsense for 50 years of my life. I was taught it by friends, by family, God help me, by my family, my ministers, my pastors, my Sunday school teachers, everybody of a Christian influence in my life taught me the same load of hooey. They're all deceived. They love to be deceived and to, to deceive others. And they cannot be trusted anymore. They cannot be trusted anymore. And uh, I'm learning what it's like to trust the scriptures and the scriptures alone, to trust Jesus and him alone. And I now have to believe in grace and grace alone, through faith and faith alone. He that, you know, we believe by faith, and uh, that's the faith of Jesus. That's the faith of Daniel, and now I'm on the right track, and now I can name you names of those who have deceived us. We can put a mark on them. Ichabod! Stay away from them. Don't submit yourselves to their so-called spiritual and eschatological authority. They're liars. They're sinners. They made a living out of bilking millions and millions of Christian dollars and then returning for that lies to deceive us and put us in the wrong direction. Those so-called ministers of righteousness should be unelected from behind the pulpits of the churches. We need to take back God's real estate and put a man of God, a Bible-believing, King James Bible believer behind the pulpit of the churches and stop this futurist nonsense before it consumes us all. Back to you, Yerk. You know, Tom, the whole deception of the ministers of righteousness goes so much farther than just stopping at the ministers behind the pulpit in the churches because... Let's face it, most people in the world don't even go to any church, so they won't hear the ministers of righteousness, um, which are transformed by the, uh, which are the transformed ministers of Satan in the churches. They won't even hear them. But the deception is so much deeper because it goes into the world, it goes into the secular world, it goes into the political world, and therefore goes right I'd, into Washington D.C. It therefore, goes right. Washington, yeah. D.C. It's the same pastors, the so-called ministers of righteousness, who have deceived us all of our lives are the ones who are most influential and controlling in Washington, D.C. That ought to raise the hair on the back of everyone's neck. 
that ought to just scare the living two hooey out of everybody that understands this. What kind of deception cont- controls Washington, D.C.? Not only Washington, D.C., Tom. We are speaking of all the capitals of the world. You know, oh, yeah. when, you, when you look at, when you look not only at uh, the President of the United States, but when you look, for example, as the, at the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, or you look to the Bundes, uh, Bundeskanzler, the Chancellor of Germany, or any other uh, political leader in the countries, uh, when they go out there for a speech somewhere, don't they also stand behind the pulpit? They are the same ministers of righteousness that the Bible speaks about. So, of course, at first he puts them in the churches to deceive God's people, but he also puts them behind every other pulpit in the whole world. Why do you think university professors teach from a pulpit to hundreds of students in the big audience uh, rooms they have there? That's the same system. That is the same... um, how, how, how do you how, how do you call it? It's the same situation all over the world. Wherever there is someone behind the pulpit preaching to people, whether he's preaching biblically or he is preaching politically or secular, he is a minister of righteousness from Satan. Yeah, that's what we have to understand. They get you not only in the churches, but they get you in secular life too. They get you with all the politics. I mean, this is something that we speak about, of course, in the other, in the uh, End Time Delusion uh, book reading that we are doing. How the whole world is deceived by that. How the whole world accepts a nation state of Israel today. That is only because a false explanation of Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27 and they are using all the pulpits of the world starting with the I mean when when I went to school when I was a first grader I sat down in the chair behind a little table and my teacher was behind the pulpit that starts already all your school education time long, all your university, high school, university and other studies that, that you do, every time you listen to someone, he is behind the pulpit. And if he is not behind a physical pulpit, then he is behind a spiritual pulpit because he speaks of a quote-unquote authority. An authority that you can read in Revelation chapter 13 that has been given by the dragon to the beast and they are all servants of the beast. I think this is so important, Tom, that we also make the point it is not only in the churches, because of all the people in the world, and I don't even want to call any numbers how many people are quote-unquote living on this earth for the moment, because I cannot verify any of the numbers they throw at us. It can be half of that, it can be double of it, the, t- the number can be correct, I don't know, I never counted them. Um, But the point is, most of those people don't even attend the church. Those who attend the church will be caught by the guy here on the right side, but all the others will be caught by the wolf in sheep's clothing on the left side. Every politician promises you, I'll work for you. I make you feel better. I take care of that you will earn more money. I will take care of that you will get more rights in this and get more rights in that and make it easier for you here and easier for you there. And what does he do once he is in office? Do I really have to say it or can you end the sentence for yourself? Uh, please, Tom, I think that you have probably a, <laughs> a nice explanation to what I just said. Yeah, well, going a little bit deeper look, into that. Look, I, I can simplify this for everybody. I mean, I don't take anything away from what you said. All the other so-called ministers of righteousness that you named. But I focused on the ministers of righteousness behind the pulpits of the churches, and here's why. What if we had the spiritual wherewithal, the spiritual fortitude to fire every one of those futurist pastors behind the pulpits of our churches? What kind of a message would that send to all the other so-called ministers of righteousness that you mentioned? Would we not have put them on notice that we will no longer tolerate their deceptions? If we had the intestinal, the spiritual courage 
to fire those deceivers behind the pulpits of our churches. It would send a message that would ring all across Washington, D.C., and all across all the other governmental institutions in this world. We're not going to tolerate any more deception. We're going to straighten up the record. We're going to start telling the truth. And what would happen to all the other so-called ministers of righteousness that you mentioned that were planning a, few, or a, a, a rebuilt nation of Israel on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea that are creating the most global deception the world has ever seen. You know, I don't want anybody to come away with this thinking that I have some grudge against the Jews. I believe what Paul said. Paul said that he would give up his own salvation for his brethren, the Jews, if they would only receive the gospel, receive Jesus Christ. He said our mission as Christians was not to persecute or condemn the Jews, even though they did slay our Messiah. We should be in the business of provoking them to jealousy for their own Messiah, Jesus, whom they slew 2,000 years ago. That is my job. That is your job. That is everyone who names himself a Christian. His purpose in life, among others, is to provoke the Jews to jealousy for their Messiah. That is God's righteousness. That's what he wants, reconciliation with the Jews as much as he does with the Gentiles. That's why he sent his son to die. He didn't send his, done, his son to die just for Gentiles. He came to the house of Judah first. And he said, not, go not unto the way of the Gentiles until the 70th week is over. The 490th year is ended. Then go to the Gentiles. But I'm going to give my house of Judah one last chance. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, Daniel, the Jews and Jerusalem to make an end of sin, to bring in reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. That's what I want for the Jews. But listen, believers, what good does it do to think God is having anything to do with creation of a modern nation state of Israel and then forcing the Jews to go live there so that they can build a, te a temple and begin animal sacrifices to eat and drink damnation to themselves. The Jewish people are still in a state of unbelief. You cannot immigrate to the modern nation state of Israel if you declare yourself to be a Christian. They absolutely will not tolerate Jesus in Israel. If you believe in Jesus in Israel today, you must believe it secretly. Okay? You must keep it to yourself lest you become an enemy of the government. Why would the God of glory bring his, his Jewish brethren, his Hebrew brethren, back to Israel to eat and drink damnation to themselves, to prove once again that they, re that they reject Jesus as their sacrifice and begin sacrificing animals again? What Christian in his right mind would financially support a modern nation state of Israel and get Jews to live there in order so that they can build a temple and prove once again they reject Jesus. It defies all common sense, and I'm, I'm telling you, if, if these listeners are honest with themselves, they have to realize by now they believe the lie, just as I have, and the consequences are just as grave for them as it is for me, and they, that their enemies are my enemies, my enemies are their enemies, and who are they? Those who have sold us this lie behind the pulpits of the churches and who are parroted by every other so-called minister of righteousness in Washington, D.C., in Des Moines, Iowa, and every other state and federal capital in the United States of America, every local city council, every county government, they all believe these lies, they teach these lies, they enforce the rules that support these lies, and if we want to stop this, we have to get rid of the liars behind the pulpits because they're following their example. Start with the pastors of the churches. Get them out from behind 
the pulpits of the churches and put a historicist behind the pulpit of the, of the church, one who knows the scriptures, one who knows history, and one who knows the prophecies regarding the 70th week of Daniel. Then we'll send a message that will ring loud and clear across this country and the whole world, and it'll put Jerusalem on notice. Do not build a temple. Do not begin animal sacrifices again. You believe in Jesus, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, or you'll never see life. That's the message for the Jews in Jerusalem today. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I absolutely agree with everything you said there. Um, the point being, what you said, what if we threw all the false teachers, all the ministers of righteousness, so-called, from the pulpits, that happened 500 years ago. That happened already with the time of the Reformation. In the, time right. of the, in the time of the Reformation, the people all of a sudden awoke out of the darkness, out of the sleep they were put in for, thousand of year, for a thousand years, because the Roman Catholic Church held away the Bible from them, held away the truth from them. And when all of a sudden people could read the Bible for themselves in their own languages, because in the Middle Ages, when you went to church on Sunday, which you were obliged to, because if you didn't go Sunday, black men were knocking on your door Monday asking where you were. The point is that when the people at that time all of a sudden read the Bible in their own language, they read it in French, they read it in Italian, they read it in Spanish, they read it in English, and they read it in German, all of Europe became shaken by an earthquake. The earthquake that the temporal rulers all of a sudden saw that they were betrayed and they now had to face the wrath of the people and the ministers of righteousness, quote unquote, in the churches all of a sudden understood that they were betrayed and the people saw that they were betrayed and the people revenged themselves on those ministers of righteousness, so called. 500 years ago, why can't we repeat that today? Today That's we have exactly the point I've been making all along. Today we the have infinitely more power to spread the word because we have the internet, we have all these technological advances that are used to control us and to keep us down and we could use that in our advantage because everything can be used in a good way and in a bad way. And this technology of today is used in a bad way by the people who rule us. But we can use it also in a good way to spread the word and to spread this news. And this, maybe you didn't see that coming, but I'm telling you right now, everybody who watches this has a YouTube channel. And when you have a YouTube channel and you stand behind the message of this video and you don't re-upload this video to your own channel, you have to ask yourself why. And you have to answer to God why you didn't help spread the word that is the truth. Well, I'll tell you, if, if we uh, do something permanent with the liars behind the, the futurist liars behind the pulpits of the churches... We will, with that act alone, put the fear of Almighty God in the hearts of everyone else in this world who could be counted as a minister of righteousness. Because that's precisely what happened during the time of the Protestant Reformation. When God's people finally read the scriptures for themselves in their own languages, instead of being spoon-fed by ministers of righteousness, so-called, they learned the truth, and they put those ministers of righteousness on notice, and that put the governments of all of Europe on notice, and that's what resulted in the Protestant Reformation. We put Jesus back on the throne, and we, un we dethroned the Pope and all of his kings. That's precisely what would happen today if we would eject reject, fire, and prosecute 
all of the liars behind the pulpits of the churches today, we would have ourselves a new Protestant Reformation. Only this time, I think we ought to go all the way instead of just part way. Back to you, Yerk. We have to drive out all the Roman Catholic leaven out of the studies that are then in there. So, study. Let's continue in this study. I put another verse in here, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. To make reconciliation for iniquity is also mentioned there. It says, quote, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Or, okay. as I put in bold letters, it behooved him, speaking of Jesus Christ, it behooved him to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now, can you okay. tell me of any verse that is more clear about that verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9 is being utterly and completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ? Now, I have a question. If we are, as the scripture declares, that we are now reconciled to God, our sins have been dealt with, our sins have been washed away in the crimson tide of Christ's sacrificial blood, then why does anybody still insist on making sacrifices? Whether they be Jew or Roman Catholic or Lutheran, is it not a mark of apostasy? A mark of rejection of that reconciliation when they make sacrifice of any kind? That's the point I want to make. But before we make any other points, we have to understand from the Scriptures exactly what you just said. There is no other passage in all the New Testament that convinces us that Christ fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel and in this particular method he made reconciliation for iniquity. That's exactly the same thing as to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Almost word for word what Daniel prophesied. And this is only just one example. There are many, many, many. It's almost when you, when you finish this study, when you do your own study on this subject, you can almost come to the same conclusion that I've come to. One of the principal, one of the principal reasons for the New Testament to be written was to be a witness of every detail uh, of the fulfillment of every single detail of Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, and that it was Jesus who did it all. And the, uh, the, the most difficult conclusion we can come to after we, regal, after we realize this truth is that there is no future fulfillment, not of the whole prophecy or any element of it. So what do you do now with this idea of a future antichrist is going to make a covenant with the Jews? Well, there's not going to be any future antichrist to make a covenant with the Jews. Unless he's a deceiver. Because the 70th week of Daniel is over and it was Jesus who made a covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he gave his life. A sacrifice and a ransom for us all. He made reconciliation for iniquity. He fulfilled Daniel's prophecy to the letter. Perfectly. Just as Gabriel gave it to Daniel. Just as Daniel wrote it in the scripture. It is finished. So since there's not going to be a future Antichrist to do anything, well, then maybe the, the Antichrist is historical. Maybe he's been with us all along. Bingo. He has been with us all along, just like Paul prophesied. As soon as the Caesars are taken out of the way, those who are restraining the rise of the Pope, as soon as the Caesars are taken away, the Pope will be revealed. That man of sin, that son of perdition, 
who will deceive God's people, think to change God's times and laws, will be a, a persecutor of the saints, will wear out the saints of the Most High. For 2,000 years, he'll wear out the saints of the Most High. For 2,000 years, he'll persecute the saints of the Most High. For 2,000 years, he will persecute and kill and murder and de dismember and torture God's people. For 2,000 years, and all the saints have died all throughout the last 2,000 years, and no one takes it to heart. The righteous perish, and no one takes it to heart. Nobody even mentions Fox's Book of Martyrs anymore. It used to be required reading of God's people. You never hear it mentioned anymore. And if somebody does mention it, you look down on them as someone who is a divider rather than a uniter. Someone who is trying to sow division in the body of Christ. So let me tell you something. Roman Catholicism is not part of the body of Christ. There, I've said it. It's the synagogue of Satan. It is that which God's people should be praying against. It is God's mortal enemy. It is your and my if we be Christ's, it is your and my mortal enemy. But here we see in this ecumenical movement all these wolves and sheep's clothing, all these high-priced hirelings behind the pulpits of the churches, denying that the Pope is the Antichrist, denying that the papacy is the Antichrist, denying that the Pope for the last 2,000 years has persecuted, dismembered, tortured, burned at the stake God's people and has forgotten Fox's Book of Martyrs, no longer recommends that book, no longer recommends that we should say anything negatively about the Roman Catholic Church, and that they're Christians just like we are, that we ought to unite with them in ecumenical unity so that the body of Christ can be whole. They are liars, diabolical liars. They occupy the most pristine, most valuable turf in this world, the pulpits of the churches, and they ought to be fired forthwith and replaced with a God-fearing, Bible-believing Christian. And if we don't have the guts to do it, then we'll go the way of Baal. Well, I'm not going. I'm not going. Back to you, York. Amen, brother. Hard to go on from that, what you just said, but we still have a few verses to cover today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Also, in confirmation of that Jesus Christ made reconciliation for iniquity, says, quote, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, who, who do we reconcile to God? It's our ministry to reconcile the Jews. Just like Paul said. We are to offer to the Jews the same reconciliation that Jesus offered to us. You see, they rejected the covenant that Jesus made. We accepted it. As Christians, we accepted it. Now, let us heal our Jewish brethren. Let us love our Jewish brethren and tell them about Jesus and how he perfectly fulfilled Daniel's prophecy. And realize as Yerk can explain to you, it was the Jewish rabbis who forbid the Jews to go to the book of Daniel and to discern the timing of the coming of Messiah. How is it that you can go to Daniel and discern the very timing of the first coming of Jesus? Daniel's prophecy. Daniel's prophecy literally makes a red X on the calendar when you can expect Messiah to come. The day and the hour, if you will, 483 years from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's 69 weeks, isn't it? It's so clear in its instruction when Messiah the Prince will come that even Simeon was standing on the steps of the temple waiting for Messiah to come to be baptized and circum or to be circumcised in the temple. You don't think the Holy Spirit just came to, to uh, Simeon and told him, Hey, Simeon, Jesus is coming to the temple today. Be on the steps waiting for him. No, no, no. 
the Spirit spoke to Simeon just the same way he speaks to you and me through the Scriptures. And it was Daniel's prophecy that gave Simeon the precise timing of Christ's return, knowing that he would be about the age of a priest, 30 years of age, when he would become be, be known as the Messiah. So it was 30 years before the 483rd year, Simeon was waiting on the steps of the temple. 483 years minus 30. And there was Messiah wrapped in swaddling clothes eight days after his birth, being just like a true believer in Jesus would do, comply with the law, go to the temple to have the child circumcised on the eighth day of his birth. You couldn't find a better prediction for the coming of Jesus to the temple. And that's how the Holy Spirit reveals his truth. He simply un unlocks the meaning of the scriptures to you. But he gets his information from the scriptures nowhere else. He's not allowed to speak to you unless the Father tells him what to say. And the Holy Spirit doesn't have to say a word to you. All he has to do is put you in the right mind that when you open up Daniel's 70-week prophecy, you have all the information you need to exactly when to expect Jesus, the Messiah, the Prince. And if you want to beat the rush, just turn the clock back 30 years and you'll find his birth date or eight days after his birth. And trust me, ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't December 25th. And there he was on the steps of the temple in the arms of his mother. And Simeon saw him. My eyes have beheld the salvation of Israel. Simeon understood the prophecy. Nobody understands it today. Back to you, Yerk. Simeon says here, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. That's what Jesus Christ was. Because Jesus Christ was the one, and still is the one, that takes us Gentiles who are not branches of the tree of Israel and gives us the light, his light. He is a light for revelation to the Gentiles. So when you deny that Jesus is the Christ, then you just close your eyes before the light because you don't want to see the light. And that negligence you will pay dearly for. And that's the point this Simeon part in the Bible is all about. We have to provoke the Jews to jealousy because it is because of them that we have been given the revelation of the light that Jesus Christ is when he came into the world. Your, can I ask the listeners a question? Please, sure. If the, if the listeners would just think with me for a moment. Let's just imagine in our hearts, and if only our imaginations could produce the truth, let's just imagine in our hearts that in a day, let's say tomorrow, the Jews all comprehended, after 2,000 years of suffering, by the hand of Christian Gentiles, no less, that Jesus was their Messiah, that he paid their sin debt in full, that he fulfilled the covenant that he made with them? How much ambition do you think you would find among them to build a temple to begin animal sacrifices again? Think about it. Do you think they would continue to clamor for a temple and a priesthood? Think about it. And then after realizing the last thing they would do is to build a temple and begin animal sacrifices instead of just receiving the sacrifice of Jesus that was given for them 2,000 years ago, every single one of those Jews who would reject the idea of establishing a priesthood and to build a temple and to begin animal sacrifices again would all of a sudden realize what need have we for a modern nation state of Israel? 
we can be comfortable living in every land in this world because we all, Jew and Gentile, have the same salvation. There would be absolutely nothing accomplished by having a modern nation state of Israel. Look, after all, since 1948, have the Jews ever had any peace? Do you really think that God led them there and denied them peace? I begin to ask my question, will they ever have peace? I'll tell you, the Jews will never have peace unless they receive the Prince of Peace. And trust me when I tell you, it is not the Pope of Rome. It's not the United States of America. It's not the United Nations. It's not all the governments of the world. It's not man at all. It's Christ, their Messiah, the one prophesied by Daniel, the one who came right on time, as expected, as prophesied. And he did just exactly what Daniel said he would do. Make reconciliation for iniquity and establish a kingdom that will never end. And all Christians will say, well, Jesus has not established his kingdom yet. There's no Christian kingdom in the world today. Then why is it it says so many times in the New Testament as we read this infallible record of messianic history where it says, and God added so many, so many, so many to the kingdom daily, okay? Read it over and over and over until it makes sense to you. There were so many added to the kingdom. There were so many added to the kingdom. And to the kingdom, so many were added. As the gospel went forth, there was people's names added to the what? The kingdom. Jesus is our king. We have a king. We have a kingdom. Why do we keep saying that Jesus is going to bring his kingdom? It's that same wolf in sheep's clothing behind the pulpit of the church. The same one who preaches the futurist baloney has still convinced us God's people that we our kingdom has not yet come. Are you beginning to understand? To put it mildly, my frustration with these wolves behind the pulpits of our churches, these so-called ministers of righteousness who love nothing but to lie and deceive God's people with the obvious truth. And you know who we really ought to blame? Ourselves, for not caring enough to read the scriptures for ourselves, to identify them all as liars a long, long time ago. Do you realize those lies were not even told in the churches until 1805? We've had that long. Since 1805, 1810, about that time, we've had that long to uncover all the multitudes of lies that these liars behind the pulpits of the churches have propounded upon us. Whose fault is that? It's ours. And I will no longer trust any man to read and explain the scriptures to me. Today, I am a man. No longer a child. I don't need a daycare operator. Just give me the unvarnished, the uncorrupted word of Almighty God and the Holy Spirit to teach me, and I'm good to go. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Second Corinthians 5.18, I already read to you, but there is another verse that is the following, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, that says, To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation.
Do you ever hear establish everything by two or three witnesses? By every everything be established by two or three witnesses? Do you even you know when it comes down to this fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, we have more than three witnesses in the New Testament for every tenet of Daniel's prophecy. By two or three witnesses, let everything be established. That's a law of God, and God observed that law and kept that law when he recorded the New Testament to make sure that nobody would miss the purpose of the New Testament to show us that Jesus perfectly and completely fulfilled every tenet of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. There was nothing left to be done he did it all. He did it by himself. He did it for us. He did it once and for all. And anybody who tells you otherwise, I don't care how pretty he is. I don't care how big his hair. I don't care how fancy his suit or his car. I don't care how fancy the church. If he teaches you anything else, he is a liar. A beautiful liar, but he's a liar. And the churches are full of them. And those who love to repeat the lies. What good is a church? Back to you, Yerk. I think what Tom tries to say here all, all the time and what I want to say to end this broadcast for today, even though we didn't read much, but I think that you have been edified by what we were saying, is we want to... Tom and I, we are doing this study for you so that when you read the Bible, when you read the New Testament, that you understand that the New Testament is the complete fulfilling of everything that was prophesied in the Old Testament, especially Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Now, Tom and I have been engaged in the Bible study for the last, I think, almost about five years it's going on. And we read the New Testament and the King James Bible, starting with the first verse of the first chapter of the book of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, we have arrived now at the book of Revelation. And that is going to be another study, much more intensive than just reading the Bible, because the book of Revelation is a very hard book to understand, even for us, even with the Spirit leading, because... Um, we are not being revealed everything at the first moment because we wouldn't even understand it that way. But the point that I want to say, and I know that Tom has a comment on this to end this broadcast right when I'm done, the point that I want to say is we are doing this study to lead you to read the Bible for yourself, not to tell Tom what the Bible says, not to tell me what the Bible says, but Okay, we are telling you what the Bible says, but then we want you to go to the Bible and confirm for yourself that we, what we have spoken is true. We want you to do your own studies. We don't want you to go into any church and be betrayed by, any, uh, by a quote-unquote minister of righteousness there. We want to give you the tool to do your own study and come to your own acceptance of the truth. The Bible study that Tom and I have done for the last five years is so intense that maybe you are laughing now, I don't know, and I don't care, that after every sentence we see that Jesus is the Christ, that the papacy is the Antichrist, and that Jesus Christ was the perfect and utter fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. Every sentence of the New Testament tells us that when you study the Bible with that knowledge, with that understanding that Jesus Christ fulfilled Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27 utterly and completely 2,000 years ago, then the Spirit will lead you into all truths. You will, understand, you will have a complete new understanding of the New Testament, I can tell you. Because I speak of experience, and Tom speaks of experience because we did that for the last five years. And that, dear brethren, is a wonderful feeling. Because then, all of a sudden, you know, in this world may happen what wants. You don't care. Because you know the truth. You know the truth in Jesus Christ, and that truth has set you free from the bondage 
of this world. Please, Tom, your final comment for today. Well, I uh, this is the only great passion left in my life is to correct the error and to set the record straight and to expose all the lies. We've hired liars to serve us in the churches. But we get what we paid for. We paid for hirelings, and that's what we got. And uh, God left us in the hand of one who would apply the wine and the oil to our wounds instead of inflicting more and deeper wounds. But that's what we get, more and deeper wounds. Well, that just plain tells us that the innkeeper no longer serves his master. And uh, we're going to have to re apply the wine and the oil to our own wounds and bind up our own wounds because Messiah is coming. And we've believed lies. And I don't want to face him believing and teaching lies. We better get our ducks in a row. We better fill our lamps with oil. We better fill our hearts with the truth and reject the lies, condemn the lies, and be found worthy in his eyes when, we, when he returns. We have a king. We have a kingdom. We have a constitution. And now all we need is the truth. Well, you're not going to get it from a futurist pastor. So get it wherever it is found. If you can't take back your churches and put a Bible-believing Christian behind the pulpit, a true minister of righteousness, and not one transformed into a minister of righteousness, then get out and seek the truth wherever it is found. And if it happens to be on the Internet, all well and good. Desperate times sometimes require desperate measures. That's where we are today. And with that, I'll leave it back to Yerk. Thanks, everyone. See you tomorrow or next time. Okay.